So let's draw this out. So here is our nephron loop and collecting duct. And remember in our nephron loop, we've got the descending loop, which is permeable to water, not solutes. permeable to water, impermeable to solutes. Our ascending nephron loop is here. This is impermeable to water. So water is going to be reabsorbed in this descending portion. Sodium and chloride are reabsorbed in this ascending portion. Variable amounts of sodium and potassium secretion, sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion in the DCT. And then our collecting duct is going to be variable in its permeability to water. So all along this piece here is variable permeability. What determines the permeability? Aquaporance, whether they're present or not. So remember the two things we've got to think about if we want something to leave is one, is there a drive for it? Two, are there the proteins to help it get through if it needs them? So drive, there is a drive. Why? Because we are in the medulla down here. Remember osmolarity of the interstitial fluid, um, which are right here. As we go that way, we have increasing osmolarity of our interstitial fluid. Because here we're at the um, medulla, the inner medulla. Here we're near the, well, way up there, we're the cortex. So there is gonna be a drive for water to leave because of this high osmolarity down here. It gets down to 1200 milliosmoles. So the second thing we would need, some water can always get through the membrane, but we need to have aquaporins present if we're going to have a large amount of reabsorption of water in the collecting duct. And we can then regulate the amount of aquaporins present through gene expression changes. The osmolarity gradient is always there. So that's gonna be the principle behind water regulation in the collecting duct is altering aquaporin presence. Pretty cool though, the nephron loop enables the production of a concentrated urine through producing this high osmolarity, right? The nephron loop, remember how it is responsible via that countercurrent exchange, this high osmolarity in the ISF. So this 1200 wouldn't be here if it weren't for the nephron loop. Um, we would never be able to get the urine over 300 milliosmoles if it weren't for this nephron loop here. Okay, so let's look at what this looks like in terms of ADH regulating reabsorption in the collecting duct. So on this person here is um, drinking water plenty well hydrated. So we're gonna have low ADH and the collecting duct will not be permeable to water. This again could be due to either um, a, a, a decrease, an, an increase in blood pressure or a decrease in osmolarity through drinking water. 
ADH is not secreted from the pituitary and there are very few aquaporins present in the collecting duct. So there is, most of the water is gonna go out this way. This was water being reabsorbed in the descending loop. And this is sodium and chloride being reabsorbed in the ascending loop. So that's if ADH is not present. If we have a need to, for example, during exercise, we have sweat loss, so we have decreased blood pressure, um, increased osmolarity due to sweat loss. Sweat, sweat is actually hypotonic. Um, we have then ADH release from the posterior pituitary. This is going to result in the insertion of aquaporins in the collecting duct. That's what's right here. Water is going to flow out. Why? Because it has a drive due to the interstitial fluid osmolarity. So ISF down here is about 1200. Up here is about 300. In the middle is in the middle, let's say about 900 right here, 600, um, 400. So there's a drive for water to leave if the aquaporins are present. 